What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $750 and for that price you're getting a beast of a gaming PC. This video is going to be a full build guide, meaning I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to be showing you how to put everything together step by step, then show you both gaming and streaming benchmarks, because believe it or not, this system is great for streaming gameplay to sites like Twitch. While there are obviously tons of different ways you could have spent this budget, I went with parts that I know are quality, that'll work well together, and will last you a long time. Time. Plus, assembling this system is very simple and straightforward, making it perfect for first time builders. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into talking about the parts that make up this $750 gaming beast. So the first thing I like to talk about is the CPU, as other than the GPU, this has the biggest impact on gaming performance and determines a number of other factors with the build. What I decided to go with is probably the best price to performance budget CPU out right now, which is the Intel Core i3-12100F. At a little over 100 bucks, the CPU performs amazingly. Over the past few years, AMD has been lighting a fire under Intel's butt with their CPU offerings, and this little monster is the direct result of that pressure. With four cores, and 8 threads, this i3 is offering plenty of multi-threaded power for modern 1080p gaming. It can turbo all the way up to 4.3 GHz and has the amazing IPC of Intel's latest Alder Lake architecture. At this price point, there isn't anything else on the market that even comes close to this i3-12100F. One other nice thing about this CPU is the fact it comes with a pretty decent stock cooler in the box. This is Intel's new stock cooler design, which actually features a copper slug, which is great to see. It keeps this little i3 running relatively cool and quiet and the fact it comes free in the box means we're able to save money in this area to spend on other parts of the build. Next let's talk about the motherboard. 12th gen boards are kind of expensive and because we are on a tight budget I went for the cheapest board I could find that still supported all of our hardware. What I ended up getting is this Gigabyte H610M S2H. This is a basic board but at 90 bucks it's offering a decent value and supports all of our hardware. It has two DIMM slots for our RAM, an M.2 slot for our SSD, decent back panel I and an adequate VRM setup for a locked i3 or i5. One other nice thing is the fact it has a relatively neutral color scheme, meaning it should work aesthetically in pretty much any build you put it in. Again, this board is nothing fancy, but it gets the job done more than okay. Next thing to talk about is RAM. What I decided to go with is a tried and trusted 2x8GB kit of Oloy DDR4 RAM. This is running at 3200MHz CL16, which at $55 for the kit offers a good middle ground between price and performance. 16GB is plenty for 1080p gaming and streaming, and is even enough for light video editing. These are running in dual channel operation, and I will be showing you later in the video how to enable XMP on these sticks to ensure you're getting max performance out of your system. System. Now let's talk about storage. At this price point, I usually aim for an SSD, preferably M.2, with 500GB or more of capacity. What I ended up getting was a 500GB WD Blue SN750. This is solid budget NVMe drive in the ultra compact M.2 form factor. It is 500GB of capacity, and again, its M.2 design allows for installation in a matter of seconds. 500GB is more than enough for your OS, applications, and a modest sized games library. With that being said, you could always go for a 1TB instead for more storage out of the gate, or you can upgrade in the future by adding an additional SSD or hard drive for mass storage. Now let's talk about the part that you've probably been waiting to hear about, which is the GPU. For this build, I went with an NVIDIA RTX 3050, which comes in at around $350. For this price, I could have gotten RX 6600, which will outperform this in a lot of cases, but the 3050 has some nice features like the NVENC encoder and DLSS that the 6600 does not. For $350, bucks, you are getting a card that is great for 1080p and even some 1440p gaming. This particular model is the Gigabyte Gaming OC version which has a triple fan design and a very beefy heatsink. This like all 3050s has 8GB of video memory and is the cheapest way to get an NVIDIA ray tracing capable card. This was definitely a tough choice but I think it worked great in this build. With that being said if you would have went for the 6600 then let me know why in the comments below. For the power supply, I knew I didn't need anything super high wattage, as the estimated power usage for the system tops out at around 300 watts, but I still wanted something with a good amount of power headroom and something that would be reliable. What I ended up grabbing was the Asus Tough Gaming 550 watt power supply. For the only $45 I paid for it, it's offering a ton of value, it's 80 plus bronze rated, has all black sleeve cables, and is regarded as one of the best budget power supplies on the market today. 
The one minor downside is the fact it is non-modular, but thanks to our case, all the excess cables are neatly hidden away. Speaking of the case, the case I went with is the DIY PC ARGB Q6-W. This case comes in at only $50, and for that price, it's offering a ton of value. It's a relatively compact micro ATX tower featuring a tempered glass side panel that's actually toolless, which is kind of unheard of at this price point. It has a power supply basement, one included ARGB fan, and this cool little RGB panel at the front of the case. It's not full mesh, but there's still plenty of space for airflow, and overall, I think this case is insane good for the price. Not only this, but building in this case is super simple even for its compact size. All in all, for $750, you're getting a set of quality parts that'll last you a long time and allow you to do a ton of different stuff on your PC, from gaming to streaming to even video editing. So now that you've seen each of the parts and learned about why I picked them, I'm now going to show you how to put everything together step by step. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver. I'd highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver. This will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. So with your schedule cleared, your workspace open, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. The first thing you want to get out is your motherboard box. Open up the box and grab out the board itself and the IO shield that looks like this. Once out, you can take the board out of the bag and place it on top of the box. Now go ahead and get out your CPU and bring your attention to the center of the board. With your CPU ready, press down and out on this metal retention arm, then hinge it all the way out like this, then flip up the other part like this. Take your CPU and line the cutouts in the top and bottom of the CPU with the bump outs on the socket. I'll add an extra visual here as this is completely different from how Intel's done it in the past. Once lined up, lower it down, applying no pressure. Once it's seated correctly, hinge down this part right here. Now you need to hinge the socket arm back down, but as you're doing this, hold down this other piece like this. This does take more force than you might expect, and the cover will pop off, which is normal. Make sure to save this cover as you'll want it if you ever need to RMA your board or sell it in the future. With that done, get out your stock cooler. If you flip it over, you can see there's thermal paste pre-applied. Make sure not to touch this as contaminants could hurt cooling performance. Now take your cooler with the fan cable oriented in this direction and line the pegs on the cooler with the holes in the motherboard. Once down, press in one of the pegs like this, then do the opposite one, then do the other two. Once all the pegs are in, grab the CPU fan cable and bring your attention to the top right of the board, which is where the CPU fan header is located. Take the cable and line the notch in the connector with the bump out on the header. Once lined up, just press it into place. Once that's done, you can take the fan cable and just tuck it down slash out of the way like this to keep the build looking clean. With that done, you've successfully installed your CPU and cooler, and now you can bring your attention to the RAM slots to the right of the cooler. Start by opening up the clips on both of the slots. Take your first stick and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it down. Once you're sure it's in correctly, press down on both ends until it's fully seated and the clips snap shut. Now all you have to do is repeat the process for the second stick of RAM and once that's done, it means you've successfully installed your RAM kit and we can now take our attention to the M.2 slot. Start by pulling out this little plastic peg right here like this. Now take your SSD and line the notch in it with the notch in the motherboard header and insert it at an angle. Hinge it down and then secure it into place using the peg that you released earlier. With that done, you have successfully installed your SSD. You can now move your motherboard to the side and open up your case box. One tip is to lift the box away from the case and not the case away from the box. Once your case is out, you can remove the glass panel by pulling on the tab to hinge it out, then lift it away. You can now remove the top and bottom thumb screws from the back panel and then pull back on and lift that panel away. Both these panels can be put into the case box as this will keep them protected and out of the way. Now you can go ahead and untie and remove this little bag that contains all the screws necessary for building your PC. Also at this point, I push the fan and light Molex cables to the back of the case. Now with the case lying on its side, you want to remove PCIe cover slot 1 and 2 by bending them back and forth until they snap off and can be lifted away. Next, you can grab your I.O. shield you removed from the motherboard box earlier, orient it like this, and lower it down to the I.O. cutout. Once lined up, press each corner in one at a time until they snap in and the I.O. shield is secure. You can now grab your motherboard, handling it by the cooler, and lower it down at an angle like this, hinging it down and making sure the I.O. lines up with the I.O. shield, and that you can see the standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. 
Now take out six motherboard screws that look like this from the screw bag, take them and install one into each of the motherboard holes with a standoff beneath it. You can now put the case back onto its feet and grab out your power supply. You can take your power supply with the fan facing down and insert it into the back of the case like this, lining up the holes on the PSU with the holes on the case. Now take four screws that look like this and install one into each of the holes on the back of the case. You should have ones like these that came in your screw bag and a set that came in your power supply box. Either one will work fine. With that done, you can start routing cables. Start by taking the big 24 pin cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. You can now take the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this and push it through this hole up here. You can now take the blue USB 3 cable that looks like this and push it through the same one as the 24 pin. You can now take the two little block connectors that look like this, one saying USB and one saying HD audio and push them through this hole here. You can now take the little front panel connectors and push them through this hole here and now take the PCIe power cable that looks like this and push it through that same hole. Next take the two Molex connectors from the case that look like this and plug them together like this. Now take a Molex cable from your power supply and plug it into the white end of the chain like this. We can now flip the case onto its side and start plugging everything else in. Start by bringing your attention to the top left of the motherboard and by grabbing our CPU power cable and plug it into the CPU power header by lining the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header and then pressing it in place. With that done, we can move to the right side of the case where we'll plug in the 24 pin and USB 3. Start by taking the 24 pin, line up the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header and press it into place. For USB 3, just take the connector and line the bump out on it with the cutout on the header and press it into place. We can now move our attention to the bottom of the board starting at the left side. Take the HD audio cable and bring it to the HD audio header on the motherboard with the HD audio text facing down, line it up and press it into place. Next take the USB 2 cable and plug it into one of the two open headers with the USB text facing up. Now we can plug in those pesky front panel connectors, start with the power LED ones and plug them into the top left two pins with the positive green one to the left. Now take the HD LED connector and plug it in directly below the power LED again with the positive to the left. Next take the power switch connector and press it in directly to the right of the power LED. Now finally take the reset switch and plug it in directly below the power switch connector. With all those cables plugged in, it means it's time to install our graphics card. At the back of the case, flip down this little cover. Now go ahead and open up the PCIe lock on the top slot of your motherboard and bring your card to the slot, lining the cutout in it with the cutout in the slot. Once lined up, just press it into place, making sure the PCIe lock snaps shut. With that done, you can take one or two of the same types of screws that we use for the power supply and install them at the back like this to secure the card into place. Now just flip the cover back up like this. This cover is kind of annoying and falls off easily, but you can just hook it back on like this if it does fall off. The final thing to plug in is the GPU power cable. This installs just like the other power cables by lining up the clip, lowering it down, and pressing it into place. With that done, all your hardware is successfully installed, but there's one thing to do before reinstalling the panels, which is cable management. Basically, just pull all the excess cable link to the back of the case and try and make things as flat and neat as possible. The power supply came with zip ties and Velcro cable ties, which you can make use of if you want on the various tie down points. Just make sure the cables are flat and the main chamber looks good, as that's what you're going to see. Once you're happy with it, go ahead and reinstall the back panel. Now, just reinstall the glass panel, and boom, you've finished building your new piece. PC. Now the physical aspect of building the PC is done, but there are still a number of things you need to do before you're able to start downloading and enjoying games. The first thing to install is Windows. I'm not going to show you how to install Windows in this video, but I'll leave a guide on how to do this in the description. It's super simple to do and doesn't take much time at all. Once Windows is installed, you'll need to install drivers. For the graphics drivers, just head to the link in the description, select 30 series, RTX 3050, then hit submit and download the latest drivers under Windows 10. Once downloaded, open it up and just go through the prompts to do the express install and once the installation is complete, restart your PC. You don't really need any of the motherboard drivers as Windows is pretty good at finding adequate ones for you, but if you want, you can install any or all the drivers listed on the motherboard support tab under drivers and tools. This will be also linked in the description below. If after installing drivers everything seems good, you can shut your PC off. Now turn it on, but as soon as you press the power button, start repeatedly hitting the delete key until you enter into the BIOS. To the left of the screen, you see a setting called XMP. Change it from disabled to profile 1. Then to save and exit, either hit F10 or select the save and exit button down here. Confirm the changes and the system will restart. At this point, you're now ready to start downloading and enjoying some games. 
Speaking of games, I think it's now time to talk about gaming and streaming performance. In terms of games, I tested a wide variety to hopefully give you a good understanding of the system's overall performance. Let's start things off with Valorant, which is an easy to run esports game. I tested this at 1080p low for max FPS, and doing this resulted in a 364 FPS average with 1% lows of 215. The system is super overkill for Valorant, even for competitive play. Next up is the ever popular Fortnite. I tested this at 1080p pro settings, which is epic view distance, high textures, and pretty much everything else to low. I hopped into a Team Rumble match, which is kind of a worst case scenario, and ended up seeing an average of 178 with 1% lows of 49. This performance was pretty darn good, it was very smooth and should be enough FPS for even competitive play. Next up is Borderlands 3, a moderately hard to run AAA game. I tested this using the built in benchmark at 1080p high settings. Doing this resulted in an average of 77 FPS with 1% lows of 58. This was good performance in my opinion. Next up is Horizon Zero Dawn, which I tested at 1080p high using the built in benchmark. Doing this resulted in an 82 FPS average with 1% lows of 57. This is again great performance on this title. Now let's talk about Rainbow Six Siege, which I tested at 1080p very high settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 296 FPS average with 1% lows of 220. This PC is providing more than enough performance in this game for even competitive play. Next up is Far Cry 6, which at 1080p high using the built-in benchmark produced an 85 FPS average with 1% lows of 70. Finally, I tested Cyberpunk 2077 at the 1080p high preset. I just drove around the city going fast and doing this resulted in an impressive 83 FPS average with 1% lows of 62. This was surprisingly good performance for how hard to run Cyberpunk is. All in all, gaming performance in both esports and AAA games is great, and this should tell you that pretty much any game is runnable on the system at 60 plus FPS. Now let's talk about streaming. I tested streaming to Twitch with an output of 1080p 60fps. I tested both Valorant and Borderlands 3 to represent an esports and AAA title. Doing this resulted in smooth performance on both my end and the stream end. The NVENC encoder in the 3050 really helps the system shine in streaming and allows you to lose very little performance when live. Overall, the performance on the system is great. It can game and stream with ease, and for 750 bucks, you're getting a lot of value in my opinion. It's also great that it's very simple to build, and I can highly recommend this system for first time builders. Again, there are a ton of ways you could have spent this budget, so if you would have went a different route, let me know in the comments below. So yeah guys, I think it's time to wrap this video up. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like, and consider subscribing. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.